Lewis, if you're our guest today. And please do what we all do, and that's uh, sign a registration pad. It's a little green pad there on the queue. And if you'll uh, take and uh, members will sign in as well. Please let us know you're here. And if you'd like to know more about our church, the things we offer, and ministries we can share with you, uh, please give us a way to get back in touch with you. Maybe your phone number or email address, and we'll be glad to do that this week, answer any questions you might have. And I uh, want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Uh, more and more people are doing that, and uh, with our present situation, uh, we are glad that you're here uh, through Facebook Live and through YouTube. Please like us and, uh, and share that post with your friends. I want to make a couple of announcements here, things going on in the life of our church. The first is a change. Uh, DMA, don't mention A, normally would meet this coming Tuesday, the first, first Tuesday of the month. Uh, they are moving that to next Tuesday, uh, the 8th. So if you're part of DMA or you know someone who normally joins us for DMA, please uh, call them and let them know that we're moving DMA. The reason for that is for the, the death uh, in the Baring family and a lot of the people wanted to go and, and be a part of that uh, funeral service on Tuesday. So be in prayer for the Baron family, if you would, and uh, be aware of that. The other thing is, we're having a prayer breakfast next Sunday morning at 7 o'clock. We, that is, is the United Methodist men. Uh, they did this years ago, and now we're going to restart it. So this will be the first uh, prayer breakfast that we're going to have. We'll be meeting right over here in the Fellowship Hall for the prayer breakfast. So, men, come along and the boys come and uh, invite your neighbors and friends to be a, a part of that. That's all the announcements other than to say that this uh, Sunday is a little bit different. It's the fifth Sunday of January. And during the month of January, I always like to have part of the service, not all of it, but part of it, the Wesleyan Covenant service, uh, Covenant Renewal service of the Methodist Church. So toward the end of the service, we'll be doing some of that. If you're visiting with us or not a Methodist or whatever, uh, please just be a part of it if you choose. Uh, it's also just a way to renew our relationship with God and uh, you can choose to, to be a part of it or not. But uh, we'll be doing that later in the service. Well, right now we're going to greet each other in the name of the Lord. Like to stand and greet each other this morning and celebrate on the car family.
invite you to remain standing if you're comfortable in doing so and join us in singing the first four verses of O Come O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, hymn number 57, As the Light of Christ Enters Our Worship Space. <laughs>
to be in prayer. I have gotten been texted all morning about kiddos that we have sick at home. So, uh, but I can't share this with you because this might be good for your age anyway. Okay, you ready for this? Moms and dads are gonna love this one. Okay, First Corinthians six twelve says, "I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything." That's a lot of words, right? A lot of strange words. Let me explain it to you. Okay, I'm going to explain to you what that means. Wait a minute. Hold on just a minute. Excuse me. Harry, can we put our phone away while we're in church, please? It, it, no, it's very distracting. Can we put our phone away while we're in church? What are you doing? No, mm, we should be playing games, right? Okay, so I really, really think in my heart that it might be more important for us to see what the Bible says than to play our game right now. Even if you are close to winning, I think this might be more important because you can play games with time, right? I see nudges out there for the parents. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. You think we'll be all right with that? I think we'll be okay. All right. Okay, now back to what I was saying. By the way, I ask him to do that. Okay? Everybody's looking around like, did Harry really get called out in church? No. Okay, so I ask him to do that because sometimes we spend a lot of time playing games and doing fun things. And fun things are great, right? But do we do it so much that it takes our focus away from things that are more important? Like, you know, that game's only going to give you happiness for a short time. Sometimes it gives a lot of anger in my household if they don't lose, if they don't win. So that only gives you happiness for a short time, right? But what if who gives you happiness for a lifetime? God. God gives you happiness for a lifetime. So just remember, and that's my challenge to all the kids out there, whether they're watching at home or here with us, that's my challenge to you. It's okay to have fun, but can we try to have enough self-control that we also spend time with God every day? Think so? That's a challenge. Can you pray with me this morning, Dad? Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for your wise words. All month we've been listening to your words about self-control and how we can follow you more. Help us always make wise choices so that we live a life that's pleasing to you and that always includes you. Amen. <coughs> That's why our kindergarten teachers don't wear robes. <laughs> so get on this straight. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Leslie. We're so blessed to have an effective children's ministry and youth ministry. I know that they're there in your prayers always. Uh, the work that goes on, not only with Ms. Leslie, but the many volunteers we have. That's just one way in which our church tries to reach our community. And uh, one way in which your gifts uh, support that work as it goes on. We'll be engaging in more and more activities. Uh, uh, our confirmands are already working in confirmation, but they will continue uh, that process and it'll kind of accelerate in the next few months uh, leading up to confirmation. And so that's another work that goes that you help support with your gifts and many of you by volunteering to help teach and help lead uh, our youth and our children. So if our ushers will come forward now, We'll receive our offering today as we think about the gifts that God has given us and the renewal of our covenant with God today, not only in our service, but in our gifts as well. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that through your hand we have all that we need, not only to support the ministries of this church in our financial ways, but also with our time and our energy and our gifts and the spiritual gifts that you've given each of us. You brought us all together as one body in Christ, each with us as different parts of that body. Lord, help us to realize that and help us to realize that ministry does not happen without each of us contributing and doing our part. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Harvard Seminary in New Orleans, and I served a church in Pikeman's Parish. Now, I don't know if you know where Pikeman's Parish is. It's uh, the West Bank of New Orleans, uh, going south along the river there, uh, on the Mississippi River, the West Bank of the Mississippi River. It's got one big highway that kind of goes down toward the uh, end of the world down there, uh, which goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And Pikeman Parish uh, is a very different place, right, Norm? That's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, Norman spent some time there, too. And uh, it was an interesting place to serve a church. And at that time, we had Sunday evening services. And so I'd drive back for those services. And every few months, I would see this African-American church. I'm not sure what denomination it was, but they would all be outside of their church on Sunday afternoon. Many of them dressed in robes, some of them the, the choir robes, the choir would be out, out there, and then there would be all these people in white robes, and they would be heading across the levee and down to the river to, guess what, to, to baptize. Uh, now, my church, we, we had a nice warm baptistry with a water heater and uh, air conditioning and heating and you know, real clean water and all of that. But this church believed in going down to the river to be baptized. And it was quite a spectacle, and I think that's what they wanted. They wanted to be quite out in the open. And so people would drive by, you know, and slow down or, or stop their cars and take pictures. But they wanted the community to see those who were being baptized. They had made a decision. They had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, as that song says. And everybody would see who was being baptized that day and having this change in their lives. And I thought, you know, that's a lot closer to what I read in the Bible than the kind of comfortable baptisms that we did at my church. Now, I know we do baptisms in different ways in different churches. And this church has done baptisms, I believe, in different ways as well. So let's look at the baptism of Christ today. It's recorded in all four Gospels, the very important beginning of the earthly ministry of Jesus begins when his relative John baptizes him. This time we're going to look in the uh, scripture from Luke, Luke chapter 3, verses 22, uh, 21 and 22. And if you're able, let's stand for the word of God. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pastor Matthew Dunham tells a story of a young boy, the age of four, who was about to turn five. And so his parents asked Clayton what he wanted as the theme of his birthday. And Clayton said, I want everybody at my birthday party to be a king or a queen. And so the parents got busy. They fashioned together cardboard and covered it with aluminum foil, making crowns. They got material and made purple robes for all the attendees. They got uh, royal scepters made of wooden dowels that were painted gold and covered with glitter and, and had little tops on those. And when the day was all set, all of the kids came and they had a wonderful time. They each received a crown, a cape, and a scepter, and they played, and they had a great time. They processed up to the uh, end of the block and, and back down again, and when it was over, everyone had a great day, eating ice cream and cake and giving gifts and celebrating. That evening, his mom was tucking him into bed. She said to him, what he wished when he blew out the candles of his cake. 
And Clayton said, I wish that everyone everywhere in the whole world could be a king or a queen, not just on my birthday, but on every day. He closed by, uh, uh, that is, Max and Dunham closed this story by talking about the fact that that's what baptism does for us. Baptism makes us and acknowledges that something deep has happened within our lives and continues to happen that is making us kings and queens, making us princes and princesses of the King of Heaven. It marks us with who we are becoming. We are who are nobodies, as Paul said, are becoming somebodies. We who were no people are now becoming God's people. The wretched of the earth, as he said, have become royalty. So as you know, we as Methodists, we can baptize in three different ways. Probably more than we can think of it. But we believe that baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So the method which we use to baptize may vary, may be different from person to person depending on the situation, but the amount of water used, our water bill, does not reflect how authentic the baptism is. This is a baptismal font here. It obviously doesn't hold that much water, but two of the ways in which we baptize can be done by this font either sprinkling or anointing, as we do with uh, little babies, either sprinkle water on them or anoint them with the sign of the cross, or we can also pour, call it effusion, and I've done that before too, where water is poured over the head of a candidate. Then, of course, we can also immerse. And some Methodist churches have beautiful baptisms that kind of work into the, the architecture of their church, and we can certainly immerse. I've heard that uh, Lake Beulah, right down the street, has been used for immersion if someone wanted to be immersed as uh, a candidate for baptism. We can certainly do that, and all those ways are authentic, because we believe, again, that it's a, the water is a symbol of something God is doing deep within us. We're being welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so, yes, we baptize infants when they come and be a part of a family in the church of God. When they come down and the, the family presents this baby for baptism, and the family answers the questions for the baby before the baby can understand for itself about faith in Christ. Because we believe in provenient grace, that term that John Wesley uh, came up with to describe what God is doing in a, in a child's life, that God is going before this child in time and space and preparing and uh, surrounding that child with God's grace. And that child will be grown, uh, grow up in the, the love and grace and surrounded by that grace of God that is constantly trying to convict and woo and convince that child to make Jesus Christ Lord of their hearts, so that revealing grace is, is acknowledged whenever we baptize an infant. But of course we know, and we talked about it earlier today, that confirmation is another part of that. So another way in which we baptize is for young people in a pivotal part of their lives as they're growing up and becoming teenagers and entering that season of their lives. And they come and stand here and they have that opportunity, if they wish, after learning, spending time learning about the scriptures and learning about the grace and the work of God in this world and of why Jesus had to go to the cross and what resurrection is all about and what the church is about. They have that opportunity to profess their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ before you, this congregation. And they have that opportunity, if they've not been baptized, to be baptized at that point. But then there are others who come that were not a part of that or perhaps chose not to profess their faith, but God moves in their hearts, perhaps in a worship service or in a retreat or just when they're alone and they come to me or they come down the aisle here and they say, I want to receive Jesus Christ 
as my Lord and Savior. And we certainly, at that point, if they've not been baptized, will baptize them. At that point, we'll make sure they come into the kingdom of God. And so those are the ways in which we perform baptism, the ways in which we recognize that we become sons and daughters of the King through our baptism. We are marked by the mark of Christ. We are brought into the fellowship and the kingdom of God, and that is symbolized through baptism. Now, you have to understand that when Jesus, uh, Jesus was baptized by John, what a radical thing that was. It was a spectacle, just like that, that church out of the levee, and people were slowing down to see who was being baptized that day, uh, figure out what in the world they were all doing out there. It was a spectacle, and it was very controversial, because John knows that back in Jerusalem, there's a whole system set up with mikvahs. These are cleansing baths, and whenever you go uh, to the temple to worship, you, you may need to go into a mikvah. If you touch something that was dead, if you had blood on your hands or anything like that, you may need to go to a mikvah and you pay, and attendants was there, uh, attendants were there to help you, and you were basically self-baptized. So baptism is not a Christian ritual to begin with. It, it was a, a Jewish ritual. And so you would immerse yourself in the mikvah there and be cleansed and be blessed and be brought back into the fold, into the fellowship for worship. But John ignored all of those mikvahs and that uh, system there that was in place. Instead, he goes out in the Jordan River. It's muddy. And it's not, you know, uh, it's, it's not controlled. The environment was not controlled and it was not owned by anyone. It was just out in the woods, in the wilderness, in the, in the desert, actually, in the Judean desert at that place, point. And John goes out and baptizes. And so that was radical. But the other thing is, John invited everyone to be baptized. So he was baptizing not just repentant Jews there who had made the trip of 40 miles to the desert in order to be baptized. He was also baptizing people like us, the Gentiles. He was baptizing even Roman soldiers who were hated by those people. He was opening the door for all to come in and be a part of the kingdom of God through repentance and baptism. And so when we think about baptism today, again, it expresses this deep longing we have, this inner longing. And I so wish um, health situations we didn't have so many, not just COVID, but the regular flu, and we got a bronchial thing going on, and all kind of sickness in our community, that we can come forth, we can line up, and I can, I can allow you to experience the water once again and remember your baptism in that way. And I hope moving forward, we'll be able to do that again in our, our congregation. But I still invite you to re-experience your baptism today as we go through the covenant words that we will be saying in a few moments. Experience and try to remember your baptism. And you're an infant, you probably couldn't do that, but spiritually you can remember why you were baptized by your parents experience that again. And this idea of renewal is so important in the Methodist Church. I want to make sure we do it every year in some form or another. You know, John Wesley said these words, he said at the end of his life, he said, I am not afraid that the people called Methodist should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect or denomination, having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both to the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they set out. As we'll be reminded that the Methodist Church was never intended just to be another denomination around the block. Got lots of those, had lots of them back in John and Charles Wesley's days. 
didn't need another denomination. What they needed was spiritual fire. What they needed was people that were caught up in a movement of, of the Holy Spirit in their lives. What they needed were people that were motivated to go out and serve and help and make a difference in their community. And so that's what John Wesley intended as he led those revivals all around Great Britain during his lifetime and as they came to America. So as Methodism spread to America, John Wesley sent instructions. And one of the things that he sent was this, this service, this service to keep our faith and to keep confessing our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and keep our faith and traditions alive. And so I'm going to be inviting you to be a part of this this morning. There'll be some words that will be projected there. Uh, they're part of that service. So I hear this proclamation. Dearly beloved brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a life found in Christ, redeemed from sin and consecrated to God. We are those who have entered into this life and have been admitted into the new covenant of Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of this covenant. He sealed it with his own blood so it would, uh, so it would last forever. On one side of this covenant stands God, who promises to give us new life in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Every day God proves his goodness and grace to us, showing us that his promise still stands firm. And on the other side, we stand as those who promise to no longer live for ourselves, but instead to live for Jesus Christ, because he has loved us and given his life for us. There are times in our lives when it is important for us to remember and reaffirm our promises and vows. In this same way, we come today to renew our covenant with God. Many generations have done this before us. Today we make the covenant our own, renewing with both joy and sincerity the covenant that binds us all to God. We are those who seek to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ, but sometimes we fall short. Let us now examine ourselves before God, humbly confessing our sins and submitting our hearts so that we may not deceive ourselves and cut ourselves away from God. So I invite you into this prayer of confession. God our Father, you have set forth the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ, whom we love dearly. We shamefully confess that we have been slow to learn of him and have been reluctant to follow him. You have spoken and followed us, but we have not listened. You have revealed your duty to us, but we have been blind. You have stretched out your hands to us, we are our friends, but we have passed by them. We have accepted your gifts and offered little friends. We are unworthy of your unchanging love. We now confess our sins. Please forgive us for the poverty of our worship, for the selfishness of our prayers, for the, our inconsistency and unbelief, for the ways we have neglected fellowship and your grace for our hesitation to tell others about Christ, for the ways we deceive others. <coughs> Forgive yes. us for when we waste time and when we misuse the gifts you have given us. Forgive us for when we have made excuses for the wrong things we have done and when we have purposely avoided responsibility. Forgive us that we have, not been, we have been unwilling overcome evil with good and have not been ready to carry our cross. Forgive us when we have not allowed the love to work through us to help others that we have not made their suffering our own. Forgive us for those times when instead of working for unity we made it hard for others to live with us because of our lack of forgiveness, inconsiderate judgment, and quick criticism. Forgive us when we are not trying to reconcile with others and when we have been slow to seek redemption. Forgive us also for these sins that we 
now silently confess to you. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has been many, uh, Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and our interests. Some are contrary to both. In some way, may we please Christ and please ourselves. But then there are other works that cannot please, uh, cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. As John Wesley wrote, let us pray this prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Write me with the thou wilt. Put me to do with me suffer. Let me be employed by thee, or lay aside by thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure in this world. And now, gracious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am mine. So be it, in the covenant which I make on earth, let it be gratifying in heaven. Amen. And I invite you now to enter into this covenant renewal, and if you are able, please stand. Please answer these questions. Will you proclaim the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ and his body on earth? We confess Jesus Christ the Savior, put our whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord, in union with the church, which Christ has opened to the people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be living witnesses to the gospel, individually and together? Wherever you are and in all that you do, we will remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world. Will you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? We affirm and teach the faith of the whole church as we baptize in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Will you support this church with your presence, your prayers, your gifts, your service, and your witness? With God's help, we hear it. Amen. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing a great Western hymn now, A Charge to Keep I Have. During this time, if you would like to make a public commitment to Christ, I'll be standing here and welcoming you and would love to pray with you about that. If you'd like to recommit your life to Christ, you may do that as we uh, open this altar to you and come down and pray for whatever the needs are on your life. Let's sing number 413. 413. Charge to keep my
God who establishes covenant relationship with those who seek to enter the kingdom be with you always. May Jesus Christ, who seals the new covenant with his blood on the cross, may he bring you peace. May the Holy Spirit guide your life both now and forever. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen. Let's join our voices together in the cross here. <clears throat> Thank you.